Lynette, always good uh, to have you on, especially during these times. We need you now more than ever. Yes. Good to see you. Oh, it's good to be here, Daniela. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I was telling you offline, I've been on the road and I was hoping to get you on sooner. This is the soonest I could get you on because I know you've been doing a lot of digging in regards, um, you know, to the bank run. By the way, I was in Zurich the day uh, that Credit Suisse UBS was announced. Perfect. Um, so I've been I've been in the thick of it, covering it. But you you have an interesting take um, on it, and we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about gold. We're gonna talk about central bank digital currencies, all all this good stuff. Um, but I thought I would pull up a, a you know a recent article here from Jamie Dimon, mm. longtime J.P. Morgan Chase CEO who said, uh, to no surprise here, the current crisis is not yet over. And even when it is behind us, there will be repercussions from it for years to come. He has, but more importantly, recent events are nothing like what occurred during the 08 global financial crisis. I mean, no surprises here mm-hmm. that the repercussions from this bank run will be, will be felt. I mean, what do you make of this statement here, Lynette? Stating the obvious or, or what? Well, it is stating the obvious. And I also think that it's kind of interesting that we seem to be paralleling what happened in 2008. And, and I, so I think Jamie was like right on top of that because almost to the day that was when, when J.P. Morgan took over Bear Stearns. And that was supposed to keep everything contained and calm everybody down. But then, and the public didn't notice anything. But then in September, well, 2008, then the public became aware when Lehman went down. So I think that he probably sees some parallels. But 2008 is when the system actually died and was put on QE life support till they could get into place the next system that will take the current system's place. And, and you know, what, what I'm talking about is like back in 71, we went from a quasi gold standard in August and the beginning of August of 1971 to a pure debt based standard in by the end of August and going into September, people didn't realize that anything had changed when in reality, everything had changed. And we're at that same juncture right now where everything has changed. Absolutely. And to that point, Zoltan Posner of Credit Suisse actually has a paper out saying that the crisis that we saw in 1971, it's not even going to be anywhere near that. It's going to be way worse worse what we're experiencing uh, today. Mm -hmm. But my question is, you know I was just observing, you know, when I was outside the head office of UBS and I was looking at passerbys and I was wondering, do you think that most people are even aware of of what's happening Mm -hmm. and the repercussions? No, no, because and, and part of that goes to the consolidation and the consolidation of power, because in Switzerland now they have just UBS. So they had two. They go into one and the same kind of every time there's a crisis and we're, we're seeing that here right now with bank consolidation into, you know, actually larger systemically important banks. But apparently even smaller banks are systemically important, or at least those that hold the money there. I just thought this one was interesting. Credit Suisse chairman Axel Lehman um, just told shareholders he was truly sorry for the collapse that led to the bank's controversial takeover by UBS. He said, it is a sad day for you and for us too. I can understand the bitterness, the anger, and the shock of all those who are disappointed, overwhelmed, and affected uh, by the development. So truly sorry. Truly sorry. And all they needed was a little more time because of the choices that they made, which had to do. And and if you think that that any of the banks here are immune from this, then you really need to think again, that high level of leverage and risk taking. I'll ask our producer to to fire uh, fire in a chart here, uh, which I know you like uh, showing Lynette, uh, KBW Regional Banking Mm -hmm. ETF. Um, and I watched one video of yours on your channel where you're saying all gaps must be filled. And I'm looking at the chart thinking, yes, Tell us when you're looking at it, what you're thinking and what led us to you doing some more digging here. 
Well, you know, first of all, I'm always digging and I love one of my favorite reports is that quarterly report from the Office of the Comptroller or the currency of derivatives in the FDIC insured banks because presumably Dodd-Frank was supposed to stop that proprietary trading, that risk-taking uh, gambling. But, but since 2008, I mean, the banks and the bank holding companies make more of their income from trading. I think, was it one or two quarters ago, 100% of their income was based on this trading. And when you look at the speculative trading that's happening in the FDIC insured banks versus the end user trading, it's really ridiculous. So what people don't realize is how much leverage is in that system. And what really kind of threw me for a loop was when I looked at, okay, so back in 2013, they created this other accounting formula to compress or make it appear that there were fewer derivatives out there because, hey, derivatives kind of got a bad name when they imploded in 2008. So what they did was they took trades that are similar because they're all unique, right? So not the same trade, but similar trades, and this would offset that. But last year, or last quarter rather, Banks, FDIC insured banks, spent $180 trillion to compress to make it appear like there's only $185.9 trillion derivative, worth of derivatives out there. Think about, I so, mean, <sighs> yeah. So, so why are they so desperate to do so, what don't they want us to know? Well, there's a lot they don't want us to know, right? Like what is the true size of those bets that are out there? Plus, mm -hmm. if they were willing to spend $180 trillion in that compression, that if they're not, if they're not having to put back reserves or pay special fees, what that's telling you is they saved more than $180 trillion in fees. And that really is an indication of the part of the iceberg that we can't see, that the public can't see. And that means that it's got to be in the many quadrillions, which that implosion will take down everything. I mean, there's no way that that can be bailed out, bailed in, bailed sideways. They can't create enough money, new money, to paper it over. That's the very, very end. And probably, you know, I mean, yeah. Where Zoltan said wow. this, is, this is much worse than 1971. 1971, we still had like 28% purchasing power left. Now we have none. Well, let me throw, throw something crazy to you. Do they want that implosion of the system? Yes. To get us to the reset? Yes. Because there's nothing left in the system. They they there's officially no purchasing power left in the currencies. It's all just on confidence. That's it. And only public confidence. Because the banks don't have confidence in each other. The central banks don't have confidence in each other. And Wall Street to the banks don't have confidence in each other. Right? So that happened since 2008. That's just been whittled away. It's just public confidence. So yes, they, it, it's, it's game over. We need to go into a new system. This system is done. It's done.